Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here this morning to open your word together. And uh, we are thankful, Lord, for the work that you've given us to do in ministering to others. We ask now for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, uh, to bring your pr presence close to us, that we can know that you are here in our midst and that you can direct uh, this study. We know our intellect alone is definitely insufficient to see these truths. We need the guidance of your spirit and we need to obey your voice. And so we ask that we can walk in the light that you've given us. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, Daniel chapter 11, let's just look at Daniel chapter 10. Um, we've laid out these, the, these first three kings, and now we need to look at the fourth. And we understand that um, initially Jeff had, so this would have been in 2015, at the end of 2015, that Jeff first started um, understanding this, and that was uh, uh, based upon, I'm not sure how they ended up coming to understand Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 4, that this was connected to Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, as far as a repeat. Um, but I, I just know that in 2016, as we moved into 2016, there was talk about this. So I'm not sure exactly the events. I don't know if anybody knows. Stephen, do you know more about how this truth came about in the movement? Because I was not really aware of where it came from. I don't know if you know. Well, all I know is in the 9th of January was when it was presented in Lambert Church. Okay. So January 9th, 2016. Yeah. And, and, and wasn't it something that, that he came to understand in December? Sort of similar to what happened with Raffia, because uh, that's going to be the following December. Um, I don't know any idea as okay. to when but, it came in. Okay, so January 9th, anyway, this, this starts to be understood. And um, I know that uh, it would have been in February of 2016 that Jeff was up in Alberta uh, for a weekend convocation. And uh, it was being talked about at that time as well. So that, that's, and that's when I first had contact with the idea. So, and, and then that's why it, at that convocation, that's when Jeff invited Heidi and I to go up to Arkansas as students, right? So, and it might have been actually March, maybe not February. Um, so anyway, the idea came about that uh, we could look at this history of the Persian kings. Now, I know prior to that, there was study uh, connected with these, um, uh, the last seven kings of Judah prior to that, right? So this was the first seven kings of Persia. And so I think that's kind of how it developed. But, but exactly, you know, where these pieces were put together and, and how they were put together, that I'm not familiar with. So the idea is that we had these kings of Persia and that they paralleled the kings of the United States. Now, the interesting thing about that is when we line these up, at least when we did in 2016, we really just stopped at Xerxes, right? Like we, we didn't look past Trump, for instance. We didn't, you understand what I'm saying? 
So that's that's where I find find this part a little bit confusing, is that we had Trump as the last president of the United States, but we're lining up these kings of Persia. That is, we're taking the time of the end in 539, 537, right? We're lining this up with the presidents of the United States. Um, so that means we would have, uh, let me see here. I'm just trying to find one of these charts so I can show you. Okay. So this would be, um, okay. I, this isn't the best slide, but this one has, uh, cause it has a few other things on it, but. <clears throat> This was dealing with these seven thunders. So you can see here I have uh, 1798, right? We have the seven thunders as we understood them. So you can see this is pretty early because this is May 1842 that I have there as the second angel arriving. So I think this chart was made in like 2014. Um, and then we have 1989, but we have the two 911s. So, and I don't know if I've edited some of this since I made the chart or not. And then you can see we have uh, these kings, the, the first seven kings of Persia. So we're going to number, you know, Darius the Mede doesn't count as a king of Persia. So he's, he's zero. And then we have Cyrus, Cambyses, False Murtis, Darius the first, Xerxes, and that's going to be Trump. But this is so I've put that in since then, you know, since I made this chart originally. And then we have Artabanus and then Artaxerxes. Right. So that's going to be the first seven kings of Persia. But you can see in this line that we come up to Trump. But we don't look at six and seven. Right. And, and so you can see how how this would fit in with what Colin is saying, right? That we should see something beyond Trump. Okay, does that make sense to people? That to stop at Trump doesn't really make sense. It never has made sense. Yeah. Okay. Now we. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Okay. Now in this, once you once you finish with this with the chart, I believe I sent you up some notes on Daniel eleven. Okay. Yeah, a while ago you're talking about. Correct. Okay. Because we would then be able to go back into a little bit more of the pioneer understandings and see if those still fit with what we're talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find this here where I put this. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's Daniel 11 with the marginal readings, that one. Correct. Okay. Okay, so we, well, before we, we go there, so um, so if we look at this chart, we can see that we have Trump. Now, what Colin is going to do is he's going to put Biden, then Trump again, right? Right. Sort of. But the, the problem here would be how we number these kings. So he's going to have... Um, I'm just going to bring up his chart. Uh, see if I can find this quickly. Okay. <clears throat> So in his chart, he's going to have 
Um, Can you display his chart? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do it right here. I just have to get it open. So, so this is his chart. And you can see that he's gonna have uh, Ronald Reagan be number one, right? So that doesn't really work with how we've counted the kings of Persia as the last, as the first seven kings of Persia. You understand what I'm saying here? So this, so, so something's wrong. Something has to be figured out on how we understand this. Because we would say if Ronald Reagan lines up with Darius the Mede, then he's not number one in this list. Okay. Does that make sense to people what, what I'm saying here? But that was uh, according to Daniel uh, 11. We had under, lined that up. Well, Darius was Reagan there. And so you're paralleling that. With yeah, five or four. Right, but I'm just saying as far as the first seven kings of Persia, because remember this, the first seven kings of Persia, they line up the first king of Persia is Cyrus, and Cyrus we line up with George Bush. Yes. Right? Okay. But, but is that not, sorry, go ahead. So if that's the case, all we're saying is that these, we have to sort through understanding how we're numbering these and why yes. we're numbering Okay, that's, that's so all I'm saying. So, so we have to sort of decide, must they all line up? You know, do we discount Darius in a sense? Because Darius is not in, the, in that first seven kings. Right. So that's maybe, is, do we approach that there, there for differently? That line right. of the seven kings. Right. So that's what we have to decide. We have to decide, can we number them this way, um, even though that's inconsistent with how we numbered them before? And, and if we're doing that, why are we doing that? Um, that that would be sort of one of the things we have to, to figure out, right? So we have to, to figure that out in the sense of, here, if we look at this line, when we first dealt with this Daniel chapter 11 and applied it to our time to get Trump to be Xerxes, Reagan is not number one, right? Because he's not, he's there at the time of the end, but he's paralleling with Darius the Mede. And so when we number the first seven kings of Persia, we start with Cyrus as one. Now we have another numbering, and that of course is the numbering that we've been using here when we mark Cambyses, False Smyrnus, Darius, and then Xerxes as the fourth. It's another numbering that's given to us in Daniel chapter 11. There shall three yet stand up in Persia, right? So, so that numbering is just a different a different way of counting that because it's a zoom into uh, one of these way marks, which we still haven't fully decided. I, I mean, I believe it's probably a zoom into, um, well, it's, it's definitely not a zoom into the first message. It's most likely a zoom into the second message. That is, uh, if you understand what I'm saying. So if we're taking the decrees, um, it's a zoom into the second decree, Darius's decree. But but it could be different, right? So we, we haven't decided. But the point is we see the problem of this counting. That if we start where we were back, you know, let's say January 9th, 2016, and we're going to make this prediction about Trump, first, we're looking at the seven kings of Persia. We're lining up that history, but we're stopping with Trump. And um, so, so that we have to sort out. And it was part of the question that was actually originally asked on December 25th, 2021. 
because in a sense, if you're going to look at the five are fallen and you're going to look at where we're at, um, you could even say the five are fallen. That's Trump. Right. So later on, when 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 Colin's looking at that. You know, Trump has fallen. One is. Well, that's Biden. That's Artabanus. And then one's yet to come. Right. So that's still something future. But that is different than what Colin has done, because he's just going to have Biden than Trump. But he's going to have Trump marked as the eighth. So you can see that as far as where we are in that line, when we're examining it, um, we're sort of in a different place depending on how we number these these kings. So this becomes basically the problem is that we haven't we haven't sorted this out yet at all. Okay. So so we we have to find what what's that? Uh one of the issues I had with uh, Colin's presentation was that the five are fallen. And one is, and really when he was identifying that, mm -hmm. um, we, we are sort of like, that would be the 25th of December, 2021. Yeah. And the thing is, he, the one is, when that would be Biden, that mm -hmm. uh, he was president at that time. So he's kind of, he was there. He would be the one that is. When Jeff was presenting it in January the 9th, but there's, it seems there's like a, a misalignment there when, when when Colin was doing it. Yeah, well, that that's kind of what I'm pointing out here. So, um, and, and that's one of the things that we have never uh, addressed fully we we've, we've addressed it to some degree because the pioneers and how they understood the explanation of the vision is that they understood the explanation is given to john during the imperial uh, period when they have an emperor right and and so the, the the one that is is imperial rome and then the one that's yet to come is is uh, papal rome where you know we've made an application as seventh day adventists generally when he says you know five are fallen and the one is the one is is in 1798 that's going to be the united states so so there's this this problem that exists on how we look at where we are in this prophecy and i believe that you can say that in a sense when we're making an application we can make an application at different places depending where we are. <laughs> and so I would agree on December 25th, 2021, if you're going to say that the five are fallen, that would fit with the idea that Trump is the fifth and Biden is the sixth. So that there's something that's going to come, which is the seventh, right? And then when we talk about the eighth, we need to understand what that means. Now, we've made an application always that that eighth was the papacy again. But that wasn't the understanding of, um, you know, the pioneers, right? So Joseph Bates particularly recognized the eighth was the two-horned beast under the Sunday law. So he was looking at more at the United States as being the eighth, that is, this apostate republicanism. So, so a different view. <clears throat> the thing is, I believe these can all be reconciled because, be, based upon understand what we understand about the lines now is that we can take a history. We can zoom into a way mark and we can create a line and, and those lines can be valid. We just need to know at what magnification we are. So 
I believe that this application that we have made with Bush, Clinton, Bush the second, Obama, Trump, and now we have Biden, um, we have to take that into account that that is um, that that is for this movement and for this time. So, so the seventh wouldn't be Trump in, in this case. If we, we took this line, we would have Trump as the fifth. But the thing is, we stopped at Trump because of where we were in our understanding of the lines. But it didn't make sense to, to say, well, Trump is the last since we're only counting five of those, those kings. Now, Trump is the last because he's representing the last president of the United States in the state prophetically that it that it needed to be in. So Trump is the last Republican president. Biden is connected to the globalists. So so we still need to understand understand that part of it. And then well, what, what, so. uh, well Biden, you know the, what the definition of Biden is, right? It's a button, right? A button? Yeah, his last name, his last name, his definition yeah. of it is button. Yeah. Where does that um, sixth um, Persian king right there, what, what's the definition of his name? I don't know. I don't know what Ardagonis is. The, under, under, six, under the sixth kingdom, if Biden's going to be the sixth, wouldn't it stand the reason that it, that king would have to have the same? Well, at least, at least have the same um, attributes, not attributes, but um, yeah. Well, well, Artab, yeah. Well, I don't. Well, well, the thing about Artabanus is he's not even. It, there isn't even agreement that he's a king of Persia. So that would be the the characteristic. Uh, that he would have in parallel with Biden is because is Biden really the president of the United States? Well, he's in the office. Whether he whether people think he's not a, a not that's a different story. But he's in the office. Well, yeah, but he's hardly even in control of his own faculties. There's no the, right. So there's no doubt he's not really the president of the United States. He's not in charge, no matter how much they try to make it look like he's in charge. What? <laughs> okay. Right, okay but he's, still, but he's still there in the presidency, right? But so is Artabanus. Yeah. Right, that's all I'm trying to say, is they parallel yeah. each other in that characteristic. Because you say they need to have the same characteristic. Right. And that would, that would parallel Biden with Artabanus. Okay. Right? Because you have this, this weak king who's who's really just a placeholder temporarily. Um, it's more like uh, hair who's been controlled by Jezebel. What what's that? Uh it's more like uh hair is the king that uh, Jezebel is controlling, meaning Jezebel is making the the the, the all things for the kingdom, but the king is just uh, like a pony there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's 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 Biden. So Artabanus fits well with Biden. So well, you know, well, that's, that's good because that's I've been wondering. Well, if we got these, if we got these presidents, right, and yeah. and the Biden comes in, and we got no, we got no. No reference of him at um, on the line. Where does he fit, and who does he um, who does he um, represent on the line? That's well, what well, my. That's good because we know who he represents now, right? Well, yeah, and 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 uh, Colin would say the same thing, though. I mean, he's going to have. If he's going to have Donald Trump being Xerxes, he'd have to say Joe Biden lines up with Artabanus. Right. Right. I mean, maybe I shouldn't put words into his, his mouth, but I mean, you would have to say that that 
that that would fit, maybe, maybe Colin wouldn't make that. No, he 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 would put he would put Ronald Reagan as the first one. I understand that he numbers them differently. Yeah. Right. But so, but but you can see how how I'm numbering them. I'm using what we used to first come to that conclusion regarding these parallels, right? That we didn't, when we had the, the first king, the seven kings of Persia, we didn't count Darius the Mede as a king of Persia, because he's not. And so when we line up the time of the end in 539 and 537, and we put it with our history, we would just say in 1989, we have Reagan, and we have Bush the first, right? They're there in 1989 together. Darius the Mede and Cyrus are there together at the time of the end. But we're going to count Cyrus as the first king. So Bush the first shouldn't be the second, right? That's all I'm saying. So, so we need to sort this up. We need to understand. And I'm not sure that I fully understand how Colin would do this. Right. Whether he would sort of dismiss this part of it. But to me, this is the origins of how we came to understand that Trump was going to be elected. It was from the kings of Persia and then from the kings of Persia, from studying that, that history, we then could look at that repeat of history that we see in these. Persian kings, that is, there is a prophecy given. But that prophecy that puts Trump there is um, it's it's a zoom into something, right? It's an application. We're taking that history and we're we're saying, you know, Trump is going to be parallel with Xerxes. So, you know, the idea is that he's going to be the fourth. It's, he's going to be far richer than they all. Trump. And he's going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So he's going to oppose the globalists. That was the main reason we chose Trump, because he was opposed to globalism. Yet, then what Jeff did is he said, well, Trump is also going to be Alexander the Great. That is, he's going to become the leader of the UN once, you know, he's in president. He's going to be pushing this Sunday law. And then um, we're going to have this, uh, you know, this, as the Sunday law gets pushed, some kind of crisis is going to happen. Trump will be then called upon to be the leader of the whole world. That was the idea. So that's what we're talking about in 2016. And we also looked at parallels with um, the emperors of Rome. So this, this is a study that was then further developed by Odilio. And so all of these things are relevant. You know, if we're going to look at how we're going to understand Daniel 11 verses 1 to 3, we're, we, we need to understand what the pioneers understood, how they put these things together. Then we need to understand what this movement put in place. And, and this is in 2016, you know, so shortly after the Ezekiel presentation dealing with the prophecy of Josiah in 2016 at the School of the Prophets, Jeff right away started being really interested in uh, the Roman emperors, right? So we, we had studies dealing with those and how we parallel, you know, Tiberius and et cetera, with the presidents of the United States. And that's that needs to be considered, right? Because that's still all part of this study. So anyway, when you see here, we put uh, Biden, but Biden is the one that is. In, in this line, if we, we look at it, five are fallen, Trump would be the fifth, Biden would be the sixth, and then there's still one to come. So this is going to be um, 
So won't the last one won't the last one be more of a system than as opposed to an individual? Well, yes, because we would line that up with like the UN in our application. Yeah. And then and then there's the eighth. Now the eighth in our application initially was always the papacy. Seventh right? is of the eighth. Yeah. Right, because he's of the seven. Now, the way that Colin's looking at this, in my understanding of it, is that, well, the eighth is of the seven. That means he needs to be one of the presidents of the United States. But this this is very similar to how people would look at um, these applications when they would interpret this as popes, right? And that's why we looked at... Um, Ralph Meyer, his his study on the popes, because that was, I think, one of the better studies uh, dealing with the popes and how to look at it. But um, we, we looked at other views on, on the popes as well. And so when people try to make these applications, the one that is to come has to be one of the popes or one of the presidents or one of whatever. I think that that's not... That's not what the prophecy is saying. This eighth that comes is the Sunday law itself, because that's really how Joseph Bates saw it. And and it's 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 the Sunday law. It's all of this history, all of this these. And when it says it's of the seven, it doesn't say it's one of the seven. That it's it's the thing that's behind the seven all the way along. So so again, that's another thing we have to sort out. So I, I don't think it's it's really a simple question, and that's why you know when it came to this idea that you know somehow this is a debate between my view and Collins. First is I don't actually have a view. Other than, I don't think that we can just say it needs to be Trump. That is, when I say I don't have a view, I don't say I don't fully understand all of this. We haven't put it together. I don't think it's up to an individual to say, here's how we should see this. I believe that the movement has to study this message and come to an understanding, I think, actually, a consensus. Uh, my view that when it came to even to time setting, um, the only way that I was ever going to accept a date, you know, back in 2018 when we started in in August, I heard about okay, we're gonna we're gonna be predicting some date. The conditions that I personally had on that is that if there is going to be a date, the movement is going to accept that date. That is. It's not going to be a huge divisive thing, and it wasn't. So November 9th, 2019, this date that we, we placed, the movement accepted it. And also I knew that it had to be something that was so plain everybody would see it. And, and definitely that's what happened with November 9th. Now, as we progressed, it became clear that the division was going to happen over the July 18, 2020 date. And that's where it did, right? So we had this group that had November 9th. They're the ones who technically promoted it, Parminder's group, and they didn't want to have anything to do with July 18th. But the thing is, you couldn't have November 9th and not have July 18th. Those two things were so inextricably tied together that uh, especially, you know, how Stephen had done it, how we had the 30 years, how we had the two periods of 777 days, all of these things, these structures, that you couldn't just say, well, I accept November 9th, but I really like reject July 18th. Uh, all of those things came together. But the, but the point is, it has to be so clear, this movement has to be creating uh, this understanding. It can't be something that's just, you know, one person having an idea. And, and so, so if I had an idea about how this should be, that's not enough. 
This movement needs to study these things. And Colin introduced some things that should have led to uh, our, our movement saying, yes, we need to study these things. You know, for instance, even if we go back to 2020, what were we studying in in 2020, in December of 2020, uh, when the declaration was issued by FFA? Well, we were studying Daniel chapter 11. That's what we had been doing through the month of November. And so we get to December, we expect to continue studying that, but that sort of shut down. Now, you know, in a sense, we were still trying to understand that because Trump is going to lose this election. And, and we, he finally does. We have January 6, 2021. So we have that whole year, basically, where Colin is studying, and then he presents his study. And what he presented should have, should have, everyone should have said, this is what we need to be studying. We need to come back to this as a group and study these things. But that wasn't really what happened, right? Instead, it became some kind of, and I call it a conflict, that is a party spirit arose over these issues, which shouldn't have happened, right? And so we, we still have to figure this out as a movement, not as uh, a splintered faction of the movement. So, uh, so hopefully that, that, that helps people understand wh where the problem is. Now I'm going to bring up this other file. <clears throat> okay. So this is, um, uh, L well, this is some spirit of prophecy quotes here. Review and Herald, November 24th, 1904. And the truth is to go to all parts of the world. It is no, no time now for us to lay off our burden. The message must be kept before our churches. Present, present the truth in its high, holy, sanctified character to the people. Read pages 13, 14, 15 in Testimonies, Volume 9. Now, why would we know that that's important for us right now? Isn't this uh, addressing many of the things that we would have seen right at 9-11? Right. So this is because Testimonies 9-11 is going to start this last crisis or whatever the title of that section is. Uh, the, the final crisis or the last crisis. But she says the last crisis is close upon us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has almost reached its complete fulfillment. Soon as the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. So we know that that would be referring to the very end of Daniel chapter 11, right? The time in which we are in, the Sunday law crisis. And that's connected to 9-11. Right. So we can see that because pages 13, 14 and 15 are all about. What happens with the great buildings of New York, right? Right. OK, so yeah, I'm just going to bring it up uh, or unless you have it in here. But uh, no, I don't. OK, so. Yeah, so the section is called for the coming of the king. Uh, and it's the last crisis is the title of the the chapter or whatever you want to call it right so the last crisis we're living at the time of the end this is 9 11 right testimonies 9 11 and then when you go through it um but if if you're also looking at that first first page yeah as you take a look at, at the first portion, the first paragraph of this last crisis, you also have the representation of the 777 structure. Right. 11.1. .1. Right. So, and, and January 11th. Correct. Okay. So, so we can see how that all fits in symbolically. And, um, and then when you get to a 13, right? 
uh, this is going to be right at the end of 12, where it's going to talk about these uh, buildings in New York, right? The lofty right. buildings. And so 13 is going to be uh, the scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty, supposedly fire, fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe. So we know that this is describing 9-11. And then it's going to be all of these events that happen after 9-11. Right. So so it's going to describe the condition of that that we see at the present time. Right. So so definitely this is extremely relevant in our understanding uh, but in applying this to our time. So Daniel chapter 11, Ellen White's really directing us to 9-11 with this prophecy of the 11th of Daniel. Now, we're also supposed to read uh, 31st and 32nd chapters in Exodus, right? So this is going to be... Um, uh, this situation, uh, right, when they're worshiping the golden calf. So that's going to direct us to the Sunday law crisis, right? Right. Okay. And then um, and then she goes about the grievous troubles will arise among the nations, troubles that will not cease until Jesus comes. And so, of course, we see that. This World War One, World War II, um, those still exist in our day in what we call the Cold War and basically even afterwards. So we're in this history. We're in, in a time of globalism. Now, when we when we look further at that with the 31st and 32nd chapters of Exodus, just just as a comment for people to consider. This is Moses coming down from the mount and finding idolatry throughout the camp. Right. That the people had made the decision that Moses, they didn't know where Moses was or what was going on. They wanted to be led as they had been led in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So the, the point that we're going to have to look at in these four chapters, 31st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, is exactly what we need to look at as instruction to us today. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm agreeing with this about the grievous troubles that arise among the nations, because this is, this is definitely going to be something that we're going to see prior to the Sunday law. Yeah. And she's, though, in, in the context here, I still think she's referring to the First and Second World War initially, right? Because we're really still in that history. I'm, well, we may be within that part of the history. I'm still seeing this more as in relative to the church and the movement rather than the entire world as far as what we're seeing in Exodus. Okay. Well, that I don't understand what you're talking about then. So you have to explain. Well, Moses was coming down from the mount, right? Mm -hmm. Moses, Moses had been receiving instruction from God. Yeah. He comes down and he finds the children of Israel engaged in idolatrous worship okay so that's the church then you're saying correct and i'm i'm applying this both to church and movement okay and okay i see what you mean then okay okay so the call is being made who, who is on the lord's side let him come unto me and who was it that came out Who came to the side of Moses at that time? Um, the Levites. Exactly. Yes. So we've, we've always taken the position of priest, Levite, Nethanim. 
that has been the accepted position that we've had as far as as far as the final call, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I still have never accepted that interpretation of the Nethanim. But I understand what you're saying. There definitely is not a line. Um, there's separate lines for these three groups like Parminder did. Okay, but we we are agreed that there is priest and Levite. Right. Yeah. Okay. And the Nethanim represent the Protestants. Correct. Okay. So that I would I would say, but I just don't have these separate lines. But what what she states here in this call, all were offered an opportunity to repent and take their stand on the Lord's side and to receive forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, does this not represent the call that is going to be made, the final call that is going to be made so that the Levites come out to stand? The Levites are then being prepared, as we have come to understand it, to be able to teach others. Mm -hmm. And then she states, those who refused to stand by Moses on this occasion met with a fearful end. Okay. Um. So this, this portion, letter 80 of 1910, being non-published, was yeah. interesting to me because of what she called out and asked to be read. Yeah, read the painful history. Yeah, so so we know that, I mean, she's giving a message to the church and, and describing their condition at that time, but it's more for our time. Correct. Now, following that through, from 1914-1. But who reads the warnings given by the fast-fulfilling signs of the times? What impression is made upon worldlings? What change is seen in their attitude? No more than was seen in the attitude of the inhabitants of the Noachian world. Absorbed in worldly business and pleasure, the antediluvians knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Matthew 24, 39. They had heaven sent warnings, but they refused to listen. And today the world, utterly regardless of the warnings, warning voice of God, is hurrying on to eternal ruin. Mm -hmm. So here again, 19... 1914.2 repeats right. what she had said in Review and Herald, 24th November of 1904. Yeah, when she directs us to these. Right. Uh, right. So she sees the prophecy of the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. So um, now when we look at that, so we have two different statements of Ellen White that that are somewhat parallel, but seem to be in disagreement. She talks about the history and connection with this prophecy will be repeated. And so we know that that's actually referring to the history of the papacy from Daniel 11, verse 36 uh, to 40, right? right? At least that's how she's taking it. So because she's going to quote that history, and then she says that history is going to be repeated. But then she says the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has almost reached uh, their final fulfillment. Um, and then in this one, it's complete fulfillment, right? So in the one in uh, uh, November 24th, 1904, the prophecies of the 11th of Daniel have almost reached their final fulfillment. And then here, the prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. So there's, so those aren't in conflict. Those are just different ways of saying the same thing. 
But what she's saying is that the Daniel chapter 11 has a part that has not been fulfilled in her time, right? Right. And But yet also the preceding history is, is going to be repeated. So this, this is another way that we can say that this repeat of history is necessary for the events of Daniel chapter 11 to come to their final fulfillment. That is, this is what we have said, Millerite history in connection with the parable of the 10 virgins is going to be repeated to the very letter, right? So we know that we have this repeat. That's Daniel 11 verse 40 B gives us that repeat of history. But in that repeat of history, um, uh, that's the repeat of history of, of what she has just described, Daniel 11, verse 36, the, the rise of the papacy. So that history is repeated as we see, because we know what happened in 1989, the papacy in the United States joined hands. So when we get back, though, to the idea that we could take all of Daniel 11 and see that it's repeating the same history from Daniel 11, verse 40b to 45, I mean, this was the revelation that happened early in 2016 or late 2015 regarding uh, that we could take these verses in Daniel 11, and we could line them up. We could line up these Persian kings with presidents of the United States. Now, I believe that we, we did it partly correctly, but as I said, the fact that we stopped with Trump didn't make sense. Right. If, if we're going to take these Persian kings and line them up with American presidents. So. It seems like, it just seems like something was missing. Right. Something was missing. But I still think the proclamation that Trump was the last Republican president and the last president of the United States, I think, bears out in this movement, in this application with January 6, 2021. That that's the end of the United States as we knew it, right? This this becomes a new era when Trump lost that election and all of those events with January sixth. Now, my view, and this is this is you know I don't have this is not like a biblical proof or anything that I, that I come to this view, but what I see unfolding is. Um, this dismantling of the United States that's happening with, you know, Trump's uh, um, all of these criminal charges being brought against him, which make no sense whatsoever. Um, to try to make this a criminal act on the part of Trump uh, goes against really the whole principles of the American uh, government to have the the opposition party basically uh, charging their opposition, I mean, like opposition to, to Trump, right? Having, um, you know, opposing parties being able to use the courts in this way uh, to, I mean, this is what you see in banana republics, right? Has America become a banana republic? No offense to you. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. That's what it seems like to me. Like, this is, is such petty stuff. It's like, this is not, you have somebody who's running for president. You know, he's running for, you know, the leader of the Republican Party. And you're going to use the court system to try to discredit him, to put him in prison, to make it so that he can't become president. Um. This doesn't really make much sense to me. It doesn't seem like a democracy. So, so America's in, in great trouble and, and that people sort of go along with this on, on both, you know, like the Democrats go along with this and even some Republicans, 
I mean, I just think it's insane. Well, I, mean, I, I got a problem with democracy. It's a republic. It's not a re- democracy. Well, it is a democracy, too. I you can't you, you can't say America is not a democracy. <laughs> or a democracy just refers to the type, of, the type of way in which you get a um, uh, you, you do elections. That it, they're they're sort of separate things. You, you, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, so America is a republic, but it's a democratic republic. Okay. Right. Right. So it's not pure democracy. But the thing is, once you start using uh, the court system and, and all of these uh, other ways to to defeat your opponent, that's no longer a democracy that, you know, it's. And to say that Trump was somehow uh, causing a, you know, definitely he wanted to overturn the election. He wanted some way in which he could challenge what had happened because he felt he'd been cheated. That's but he wasn't the asking, of the people. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't calling for a revolution. I mean that's just insane to believe that that's what he was doing. He was trying to find every legal way he could uh stop what was happening. Uh, he I definitely, agree with you on that. Yeah. So you know so to anyway the point is <laughs> Um, we have this, what happened on January 6th is the end of the United States, is all I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. The United States was in control by the globalists. There was inconsistencies, whether those inconsistencies, like I obviously if it wasn't for the pandemic, Trump would have been elected again. Right? I mean, America was doing extremely well under Trump economically. Um, but the pandemic sort of threw a spanner into the works and, for Trump. And and also, if, if Trump had won the election and it was Trump who had brought in the mandates, it would be Republicans wearing masks and Democrats not wearing masks today, right? Because Democrats, Historically, I mean, they've always been opposed to Big Pharma and the Republicans have always been behind Big Pharma. So so obviously what's happening in the United States is 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 not ideologically driven as much as it's it's politically driven. It's it's about control and power and all those types of things, not about what people really believe. So so there's it's just very confusing to people on the outside. Uh, trying to understand what's going on in the United States. It doesn't really make any sense from a logic point of view. Right. People, everybody's lying. Everybody's got their own truth. And um, so so it's it's quite a mess, right, you know, to try to sort this out. Anyway, the point is we have we have prophecy on our side. We have what Ellen White is saying here. And we should be able to, um, with God's grace, understand what's happening. So we have these, uh, so we, we've gone through these verses, right? Daniel 11, 1, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. Now, one of the things that, that I've pointed out, we got that 11 verse 1, right? So we can say that that uh, 11.1 brings us to 11.1. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm talking about here? Okay. It. I would agree it does bring us to 11.1. Yeah. Now, in this, in, in what we're looking at here, Eleven one also brings us back to nine one and five thirty one because Daniel nine one mm-hmm. records in the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Right. 
So, so this is in the this is talking about what happened there in Daniel, not chapter nine. Correct. And Daniel nine is also referencing or giving reference back to the night when Babylon fell in mm -hmm. 531 because Darius the Median took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. Right. So it's going to bring us back to 539. So it's going to, it's all going to tie us back to this time of the end uh, scenario. So even though Daniel chapter 11 is given in really the first year of Cyrus, but right. it's called the third year of Cyrus since the fall of Babylon. So um, it's going to bring us back to that history. So it's going to bring us back to Darius. So that's going to bring us back to Reagan. It's going to bring us back to 1989, right? Right. So, um, but we have this symbol of 11-1, which we we know is going to tie us to um, uh, that the final crisis. So, nine testimonies, eleven verse or paragraph one. We are living in the time of the end, right? The last crisis. So. So we can see that that ties us to that history. This is the history of 9-11. Right. Which is also tied to 1989. Right. Which, which we've seen when we went through Judges, how that's tied together. Okay. So, um, so then we have Daniel 5. And... And, and the other thing, too, about this, like, even when we go back and we say, well, and, and, and I agree with Colin, that we see Daniel chapter 3, the Sunday law, and we tie that together to this first part of Daniel chapter 11 and to Revelation 17. That's the primary, these three uh, sections that, are, that Colin ties together. But in a way, all of Daniel is, is about it, right? All of Daniel is typifying the Sunday law history. So, so we have to consider everything. We have to consider Daniel chapter nine. We have to consider Daniel chapter eight, uh, chapter seven, right? Everything's all part of it. There isn't a part of Daniel that we just ignore in this context. And you can see Alan White, you know, uh, the reference to Daniel five, nine, and 10. And here she's even so she she's even going back here well to obviously Daniel nine verse twenty five, so she says heaven was bending low to hear the earnest supplication of the prophet, even before he had finished his plea for pardon and restoration, the mighty Gabriel again appeared to him and called his attention to the vision he had seen prior to the fall of Babylon and the death of Belshazzar, and then the angel outlined before him in detail. The period of the 70 weeks, which was to begin at the time of the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So that's going to be 457 BC. And uh, we know this is Daniel chapter 9 she's talking about, right? Daniel's prayer had been offered in the first year of Darius, the Median monarch whose general Cyrus had wrested from Babylonia the scepter of universal rule. The reign of Darius was honored of God to him was sent the angel Gabriel to confirm and strengthen him. So that's the Daniel 11 verse 1 that she's going to reference. So she's going to take that and bring it into Daniel chapter 9. Upon his death within about two years of the fall of Babylon, Cyrus succeeded to the throne in the beginning of his reign, Mark, the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home to Babylon. So we know that um, this is going to be October 13th, 539, Babylon's going to fall. And then within about two years, Cyrus comes to the throne. And that marks the completion of the 70 years from when Daniel was taken captive, because he's going to be among that first company of Hebrews that had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar, carried to Babylon. Um, and then she references the deliverance of Daniel from the den of lions. Right. 
So this had been used of God to create a favorable impression upon the mind of Cyrus the Great. So when, um, so this is going to happen, of course, under Darius, right? When Daniel is delivered from the den of lions. Right. Okay. But now this makes an impression upon Cyrus. Right. So his uncle has experienced this. Cyrus knows about this. He knows who Daniel is. The sterling qualities of the man of God as a statesman of far seen ability led the Persian ruler to show him marked respect and to honor his judgment. And now just at the time God had said he would cause his temple at Jerusalem to be rebuilt, he moved upon Cyrus as his agent to discern the prophecies concerning himself with which Daniel was so familiar and to grant the Jewish people their liberty. Okay, so we can see, we've talked about this. Daniel is the one who's who's directing Cyrus to these prophecies and Cyrus then has to make that decision. That's what Daniel chapter 10 is about. Cyrus making the decision to grant the Jewish people their liberty. He's going to fulfill that prophecy written by Isaiah. <clears throat> okay. And then we look at Daniel 11 verse 2. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. The fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So we can see we, we've gone through that, that history. We can see definitely that Trump fulfills that role of stirring all up and stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. Now, um, in some of Colin's studies, there was this discussion and that they were having that, um, and they misread this verse in some way, but he shall, they had it, he's stirring up uh, Grisha, that is the globalist, everybody stirred up because of him, Trump. But that's not what the verse says. This is actually referring to, to Xerxes, uh, in as uh, Esther chapter one, where he has all of these um, people from the different parts of his realm coming together and discussing these plans to go against Grisha. So Grisha isn't stirred up. It's it's this this um, machinery of of Xerxes is stirred up. His government is stirred up to fight against the globalists, right? So I'm not sure why, you know, Colin just let that pass, why he like, even seemed to agree with it, because that's not what it's saying. So Grisha is not stirred up. It's Meda Persia, it's government that's stirred up against the globalists. Okay, now, as, yeah. as a point, from the lines that we have been studying, Mm -hmm. If you bring up Colin's figure. Yeah. Now, the way that the way that this is being presented, the lining here for Trump, Biden, and then Trump again mm -hmm. would be almost with the legs well yeah i don't think he's really trying to line that up properly though so Wait. the way that we just read the the verses would actually be better lined up as a line with the arms and chest of silver right right so so one of the things yeah but th these are all gold right so what colin is saying is this is all the united states because he's he's lining these things up and but yet we have we have a problem we have a discontinuity we have some things that just are not fitting together
So first off, we know this is Babylon, right? This isn't Medo Persia. Right. And we know this we know this is the Sunday law. And so this is Babylon. And Babylon in our time is well, it's the world, but pr primarily spiritual Babylon, the mother of harlots, is the papacy, right? We know that the papacy has control of the world, so the whole world has is Babylon, and it also has three parts, so the city of Babylon. But really, the papacy is behind it all. It's it's sort of the spirit of the papacy. That's that's Babylon, right? We would agree with that, right? Okay, I, I so have no issue with that. So we have Babylon. Babylon. Yeah, so Nebuchadnezzar is going to make this image of gold. And we know this is a type of the Sunday law, right? This this is an enactment of the Sunday law in the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Um, we're going to have a 3-1 combination with the fiery furnace. There's all kinds of symbolism in this story. Um, yet we know that when it comes to the United States, the, the application we're making here has to do with the kings of Persia. So this is the nation that overthrows Babylon. And then we're going to have Grisha, right? So the way that um, Colin has been saying it about Grisha is this just has to do with the rapidity of the Sunday law. But I'm not satisfied with that in the sense that um, we, we, have, we need to understand each of these lines and where they are. That is, Babylon has a history that parallels the Sunday law. Persia has a history that parallels the Sunday law. Greece has a history that parallels the Sunday law. Rome has a history that parallels the Sunday law. Right? Okay. Like, so all of these histories have have something to say about the Sunday law. And what you would do then is you would place these lines on top of each other and recognize that they're giving you different details about the present history. That's how you would properly do this. And it, it doesn't make sense to me to, to take this golden image and say, well, this is the United States and it's just the United States all the way down and so then we have to say when we look at Daniel chapter 11 and it's talking about Persia, because we know Persia typifies the United States. It's a two-horned power, right? It's It's got the law of the Medes and Persians. That's the Constitution, right? All of these types of things. Um, so definitely that history parallels it. And we can make a comparison between Babylon and Persia, because that's really what we're doing. Babylon is now this image of gold typifying the Sunday law, but Persia also has a history that typifies the Sunday law. And so we need to be able to lay those lines out together. But we also need to recognize that Greece has a history and you can't take the history of Greece. You can't just take Alexander the Great and throw him into Persia. No. Right? That, that was... Good. Yeah, it doesn't fit, right? So that was the problem that I had, which is why I asked Colin the question. Well, if we're going to say that it's a repeat of history, we need to understand the history correctly because I couldn't understand how he would just put uh, Alexander the Great as Trump if he takes the position that Alexander the Great is is Greece that it's a separate power it's the globalists because Trump isn't a globalist how do you put him there okay so so that that would be the issue there so i so there's light here in understanding this but in order to 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 understand this we need to realize that babylon medo persia greece and rome each of these need to be laid down in parallel and um with with Rome, of course, we have the emperors, right? That study on the emperors, and we have to sort that out. We have the same problem, too, with where do we start? Which one is number one and which one is number zero, so to speak? And um, in Odilio's study, he's going to put um, uh, Julius Caesar is number one, which makes no sense because Julius Caesar is not the first emperor, right? 
Right. Yeah, it's going to be Caesar Augustus, who's the first emperor. So that's where we get the imperial Rome. Um, and then with Greece itself, with Greece, we have this king of the north and the king of the south symbolism that arises. So, so we have to be able to place that in some kind of parallel with these histories as well. So we still have a lot of things to sort out before we draw a conclusion, right? And, and that to me was the problem, was that we had a conclusion that was premature. That is, it hadn't taken into account all of the light that we had received regarding first, um, just we examined the foundation in, you know, starting on March 7th, uh, uh, 2021. And, and we had just completed that just before, um, you know, just a while before, a month or so before, uh, December 25th, 2021, we had done 187 studies, I believe, on examining the foundation. And, um, we learned a bunch of things that once we started, once, once Colin did his pre presentation, I knew that he hadn't taken into account the mistakes that had been made in Millerite history. That is, in order to not make the same mistakes, we needed to understand what our weakness was, what, what we had done wrong, and that hadn't been sorted out. And we were just going to make the same mistakes that the Millerites had made. So there was, you know, some, I guess, feelings that, you know, I was saying that you know, Colin made a mistake and what was the mistake I needed to point out what the mistake was. Well, I did point out what the mistake was. The mistake was we hadn't examined what our mistake had been and we were just going to repeat it again. But I didn't have the answers to it, and I still don't, of, of how we sort this out. But all I knew is that we could not just um, push ahead and, and the way that I would illustrate that is route finding when you're climbing a mountain. You get off the track, you take, make a wrong decision, and you decide to continue to push through that, knowing that you're not, you, you made some error, but you don't go back where you went off the path and correct it. And, and that's what we had to do. So we have to figure out where, where we had made this mistake. We went, we went through Daniel 11. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. I was just saying, we went through Daniel 11 a couple of years ago, didn't we? We didn't. didn't well, uh, we did. We did in two analyze, analyze enough of it. Uh, well, that was before, um, you know, before uh, Trump lost the election, right? So that oh, was yeah. in. So that was in. Um, yeah, so we did that after July 18th. Or maybe even before July 18th, we we did a detailed detailed study of of Daniel chapter 11. I think it was before July 18th. It was part of our studies as we were leading up to July 18th. So we studied Daniel chapter 11, um, and we never came to really solid conclusions on many different points. But at least we got a basic understanding of it. But now when we're going back through here, we have all of this history that we've passed through, and definitely. Oh. All and, yeah, and all of the studies that we've done that we yeah. should help us to to figure these things out. But to, we have to do this together as, as a movement, in yeah. my view. So, so this is just the starting point to show some, really what some of the problems are that we have to sort out. Um, but it's really a call for this movement to study this together. I mean, that that's my my belief is that this movement needs to set aside all of these different feelings and attitudes and opinions about other people and study this Daniel chapter 11. And, not, and, and I don't like the idea, you know, that we need to just listen to somebody's presentation on it. Um, my well, that's view what is, the Adventist church does the same thing. They just listen to presentations and that's it. Right. And so even when we do these studies here, I mean, I do most of the talking, you know, but because I'm leading out. But I'm not telling you guys, here is what here is my presentation 
and you just, you know, I'm going to present it and you guys, just, we're studying together, right? That's the idea. We don't know much. You know, I don't know much. So when I come to the studies, I'm not coming with a conclusion. I'm just, I'm just letting God unfold things as we study them together. You share your, share your ideas and then it's up yeah. to us to, uh, to, uh, well, I don't, I don't even, I'm not even necessarily airing my ideas because sometimes I have no idea. Until right, we right. study <laughs> together, I haven't, you know, I haven't, um, uh, you know, I haven't come to some conclusion. I, I, I haven't come to a conclusion where I'm laying out my arguments for my position, basically ever, right? In, in right. the study that we have done. We're always just looking at it together fresh for the first time, trying to understand this. So, and, and that's what I believe has to be done. So, so when we look at this, this verse, chapter two, or, or chapter 11, verse two, um, we know how we applied it, that Trump is going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. That is, Trump is stirring up all that is the United States, his empire, against the globalists. Now, of course, a lot of those globalists are in the United States. So, so Grisha exists within the United States. But we know that he's going to fail, right? No, that is, Xerxes loses to Greece. And that's why the next verse says, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So this is the globalists. You can't say that this is Biden. No, he's not this. a mighty, not a mighty king. You don't think of a mighty king. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, if we're going to follow along with what what we've done with the kings of Persia, Biden is going to be Artabanus, right? That would be agreed. Yeah. So, so this mighty king here, it's just moving us to another point in history that, that, that we have to, we have to sort of sort out now. Um, you know, how we understand that, I, I don't, I don't know yet. I don't know how we reconcile, uh, these seven kings of Persia, the last seven kings of Persia going up to, um, you know, Artabanus than than Artaxerxes, and then here we just in this section we just skip all of those kings of Persia and jump to Alexander. So what I would say is that what we we do is we we put the globalists right there on January sixth, twenty twenty one. It's not it's not Biden. It's the globalists. A mighty king stood up, and uh, this mighty king is is what we see presently biden is not really in charge i mean he's the king of persia but it's really the globalists no, no. that have taken taken over what's that Biden is not the king of persia he's the king of persia as much as artabanus was i think we'll have to agree to disagree then okay <clears throat> Because I, I know you ain't got but a, but a couple of minutes left. But yeah, I know. Um, I'm gonna yeah. ask you this: It comes down to when when um, the mighty king takes over, right? And you have the and later on you had the division into four in four four generals, right? Yeah. So if we if 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 Greece conquers. Constant of Medes and Persia, then we have to go along with that, go along with that scenario where if the UN, which it will take over the United States, it divides into four kingdoms, right? Four generals. Well, no, I don't think that that's what you would do. Okay. That, that to me is just you're 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 trying to do too literal of an application. 
I wasn't talking literal. I was talking spiritual. I'm not talking about it being. No, no, I know, but still too literal. In in as far as you saying that the United States, that the globalists divide into four. That just, so, but the point is, when we get to the mighty king, this is Greece. So Greece is going to then, we we cut off and start over again. Right. Once we get to Greece, the Persian parallel ends in this section of Daniel chapter 11. And you now have the history of Greece illustrating our history. I think uh, where, where he's putting uh, the four generals, uh, we can uh, continue to it like uh, the world because of the, the four corners, whereby the UN now is now in line now working with the purpose. Right. It has to do with globalism, the universal empire. Right? That's what you're saying? Right. Yes. Okay. Not that the United States is divided into four parts. So, but we'll come back to this tomorrow. But the main point about Artabanus is he's not going to be part of this line, right? It's going to stop at Xerxes in this prophecy. It's going to stop at Trump. But when it comes to the kings of Medo-Persia, the first seven, if we're going to line them up with the kings, Biden needs to be Artabanus. And Artabanus typifies Biden perfectly in that he's not even considered a king of Persia historically. He's just considered a placeholder until he's Artabanus. He's considered a zero? Not a zero, but he's just well, considered. Since he's not considered a king of Persia, just as we wouldn't really consider Biden the president of the United States. Well, no, I mean, a zero is a placeholder. Um, well, I'm not using it in that sense. I mean, I don't think we just take those numbers and don't count them. He's still going to be the sixth king of Persia in our lines, in our numbers, numberings. But he's not really the king of Persia. And neither is Biden the president of the United States. But also, Biden doesn't come to play in this line, right? We don't see Biden. So we see the globalists now. So you can see how that's the end of Persia. Xerxes is the last president of the United States. Greece now has come in on January 6, 2021. And if we're following this prophecy, we don't consider Biden at all. He, he's Biden nothing. is part of the globalists. Right. Well, he's just a figurehead for, for the globalists. The globalists are in charge of the United States. So that's that's what I'm saying is why if we're counting the six, the seven, right? Biden's going to be six, Artaxerxes seven. But they don't have a part in this prophecy here. Artaxerxes is not mentioned in this prophecy. He has nothing to do with Daniel 11. Well, then you would, you would count that as a progressive fall, right? The what? A progressive fall. A fall, you know, a progressive fall. Well, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. Well, I'm just saying with this prophecy, Daniel 11, it doesn't address uh, Artabanus or Artaxerxes or Dur the other Dariuses that came after or the Nebuchadnezzars that came after. It doesn't address any of those people. It's only going to address Xerxes and then Greece because Persia learnt, loses to Greece. And so now Greece oh. becomes the power that's mentioned. And so it's going to just start over. That is, it's we dealt with Persia already. This isn't Persia. Greece is not Persia. Is there not something inconsistent about that application in the sense that we're identifying individual people and then all of a sudden we're identifying a whole entity rather than an individual? But it, I understand what you're saying, but it's not inconsistent because what we're doing here when we're looking at Greece is we're starting over basically with a new application. So we made applications of the kings of Persia to presidents, right? We're not yes. going to make an application of Alexander the Great to a person or any of these 
these kings of, you know, kings of the north or the kings of the south to any individuals in this application of Greece, right? We have the Battle of Raffi and the Battle of Paneum, but we don't attach those to any individuals. So this is a, and this is, it, it's actually a completely different illustration. Even though we have Alexander and we have these different people mentioned, uh, this is about something else that's happening. This is about Greece. And so that's, so I think it's consistent, but we need to figure out why, why it does this. Could there be I some, think. could there not be there some person behind the scenes? That is a mighty king we're not maybe identifying, but it's kind of hidden, maybe in some respect. Well, some one of the well, one of the things here is that you can see some parallels to this mighty king, uh, to the papacy, right? Doing according to his will, that type of stuff. Yes. Okay. So, so definitely, I think this has to do more with the, the papacy. Or certain aspects of the papacy, but but we'll come back to this this tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for all the things that you are showing us as we study together. We pray for this movement, and you know, Lord, that we know very little, and we need your help. Help us as we study together to understand these things, and be with us throughout this day, and bring us together again to study tomorrow according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>